That was a great session. As you can see, we changed locations. We are now at a train station nearby. Why is that, you might ask? Well, it turns out trains are a great way to demonstrate how telecentricity works. At a much smaller scale, though, in a lab. So that's exactly what we are going to show. We have Nick Sishka, Imaging Manager in the Edmund Optics Imaging Lab, ready to first explain all the lab demonstrations you are going to see today, and then dive into the advantages of telecentricity. Nick is our resident imaging expert who has been doing this for quite some time, so I think you are going to enjoy and get a lot out of these lab sessions. Now over to Nick. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Edmund Optics Imaging Lab. I'm your host, Nick Sishka. In today's imaging summit, we're going to be covering a ton of awesome optical topics. We're going to be talking all about precision is the main theme for today. And so we're going to talk about telecentricity and measurement and how telecentric lenses work and how you'd use them in an application. We're going to be talking about how to manipulate wave band and use filters in order to improve your resolution on a system. We're going to be talking about distortion and what distortion can mean in an optical system, uh, how much is too much, uh, and what it actually looks like, how it manifests in a system. And we're also going to be talking about ruggedization. People are putting lenses places where they've never put them before, and so that requires lenses to be set up slightly differently. So we're going to be talking about how ruggedization can help and what different types of ruggedization might be necessary for different applications. But as you can see behind me, I have a whole bunch of different optical drawings because the first thing that we're going to be talking about is telecentricity. So what I want to draw your attention to first is this very simple optical layout. This is just a single lens and I've drawn its, its focal points here and here with these two black dots. And there's a couple different rays that are going through these lenses, through this lens, and then I also have an aperture stop drawn here. And I have some definitions below here. So let's walk through what we actually need in order to form an image uh, from this very simple diagram perspective. And what we need is two different rays. It's all we really need to define an image is two rays. We need what's called a marginal ray and a chief ray. And you'll notice here that I have drawn the marginal ray uh, in a dotted line and the chief ray in a solid line. And that's going to persist throughout the rest of these uh, diagrams as well. So anytime that you see a dashed line, it's going to be a marginal ray. Anytime you see a solid line, it's chief ray. But what are those different types of rays? Well, let's start with the marginal ray that I've drawn as a dashed line. And I'm starting here at the bottom of our, at the base of our optical axis here. And I'm going up to the edge of our aperture stop. And then I'm coming down to again cross the optical axis. And so that's what a marginal ray does. A marginal ray starts at the base of the object and it defines where our image is formed, and it always, always hits the edge of our aperture stop. Our chief ray here goes through the center of our aperture stop, which I've drawn here because the aperture stop is just kind of in the center of the lens in this particular drawing here. And what it's doing is it's defining our angular field of view. And so that's, it's, it's driven by not only the size of the sensor that you're using, but also the focal length. And that's what we're going to be focusing on in these couple drawings is how the focal length is going to manipulate our angular field of view. And so that's it. That's the only two different rays that you need in order to define a, an image and how it's being formed by a lens by looking at an object. And of course, the aperture stop is the last thing to talk about here. What an aperture stop does, this is, you may have seen it before on a, on a fixed focal length lens or something like this, maybe a photography lens, where you can increase those numbers. And what that does is that limits the light throughput through a lens. And that's exactly what an aperture stop does, is that basically it's defining how much light can make it through that system. And that's how, and I'm indicating it here with these T-shaped icons. So let's dig into how we can manipulate these three different things in order to create a lens that's telecentric and is better for things like measurement. So the first thing that I want to focus on is I want to talk about chief rays. So I've drawn another simple optical layout here and I have our lens with our aperture stop again just right in the center of our lens here and I've drawn three different chief rays and these three different chief rays would be indicative of three different lenses. And so the different lenses are only different because in this particular case, they have different focal lengths. So the blue line represents a six millimeter focal length. The green line represents a 12 and the red line represents a 25 millimeter focal length. And so you'll notice that they have very different sizes for those angular fields of view. And you'll notice that they scale almost linearly. In fact, from a paraxial perspective, from a basic uh, first order optics perspective, they do scale pretty much exactly linearly and it's, uh, it's just inversely proportional. Your angular field of view is inversely proportional to your focal length here. And you'll notice that the numbers that I put up here 
aren't exactly scaling that way. And that's because I used real numbers from real fixed focal length lenses that exist on the market. And so that's why these numbers are slightly off is because of things like distortion that's going to be throwing off those, those paraxial numbers and making what we have here. But you can still see that they roughly scale linearly. And so you'll notice that if we go from a 25 millimeter focal length to a 12, it's roughly a factor of two, we see a rough factor of two change in our angular field of view here. And so I've also drawn four different objects and I've drawn a black line here horizontal to our optical axis just to show that these objects are the same size here. And how would the lens actually see those different objects? as we move that object farther away or closer to the lens. So let's start up close and let's focus on our 25 millimeter lens. We have our object isn't actually going to be seen all the way because it's exceeding the size of that chief ray, right? So our object is being partially blocked by that. We can't see the whole thing. So what do we have to do? We have to move our object back. And so as we move our object back, now we get to the point because this field of view is expanding as it moves away from the lens we can see that our object actually fits under there. This is a really common phenomenon. This is exactly how our eyes work, right? What this, the way that this manifests is that our magnification is getting lower as our object is getting farther away from our lens. So this is something that we see all the time. It's how we're able to drive. It's how we're able to have depth perception, right? As objects get farther away from us, they appear smaller. It's the same way that the lens that's filming me right now is actually working. If I were to walk closer to that lens, I would appear larger, right? That's the way most lenses work. But that's really non-ideal from a measurement perspective, right? Because if you can imagine now that this is a machine vision lens, and I'm trying to measure very accurately the height of these arrows, if that object moves with respect to the position to the lens, that magnification is going to change and the imaging system is going to read a different magnification. So that's obviously not good if we're trying to measure things to incredible degrees of accuracy. If we're getting different readings depending on where that object is relative to the lens. So the question is there, how do we manipulate that, right? How can we, how can we fix that? Well, if we see here from our three different lines, we could imagine that because this six millimeter lens has a very wide angle field of view, you'll notice that the magnification changes very quickly as you move further away from the lens, right? This very wide angle here, if we have our objects, it's taking up a very, very small percentage of the field of view and getting rapidly smaller as you move away from the lens. Meanwhile, if we go to our 25 millimeter lens, we can still see that it's changing, but it is going to be changing a lot slower. So we have a slower magnification change with working distance change as our focal length increases. So in an ideal sense, if we didn't want our magnification to change, what we would want is we'd want a fixed angular field of view. We wouldn't want the field of view of our optics to change angularly as we move our object away from that lens, right? So how can we do that? Hold that thought and I'll explain that in just a second. The next thing I wanna talk about is marginal rays here and what happens as you move objects farther away from the lens and where that change in focus is. So here I've drawn three objects. Again, another very simple lens layout. I've drawn our aperture stop at the, uh, at the front position of our lens here. And then I just also drew our focal lengths represented by these, our focal points rather, represented by these two black dots. And I have these three different objects and they're at different positions from the lens. So let's start with our, uh, our red ray here. All these different rays are not in this case representative of different focal lengths like they were in this top drawing. These are all the same focal length lens. This is just what's happening as I vary this distance, right? So with the, with the red ray, we can see that it's the farthest from our lens, right? And then it's gonna focus closest to the focal point of the lens, right? So basically the farther away we get our object, the closer to the focus point, this uh, lens will focus the image of this object, right? If we move our object closer to our lens, we project with this green ray, then it's actually going to be focused farther away from our lens. There's something interesting that happens is that as we move our object to the exact focal point of that lens, to the front focal point of the lens, it's actually going to focus the image of this object here infinitely far away. So I've drawn this, this dashed marginal ray here parallel to the optical axis because it's not focusing until it gets infinitely far away 
in the image space direction. Conversely, you could imagine that if I took an object and I continued to move this, this direction, right, then our focal point would approach infinity, or I'm sorry, our, our point of focus would approach the focal point of that lens, which means that our object would have to be at infinity. So if you've ever seen an object distance on a machine vision lens at infinity, what you're doing is you're getting very, very close to that focal point and where that lens is going to be focusing. And so you'll notice that it works on both sides, right? This can be image space, this can be object space, and vice versa over here. As you move the object farther away, it focuses closer, and the, and the opposite also occurs. And as we move our object closer, we're focusing farther away. So how can we utilize these and how can we, how can we manipulate this in order to get a telecentric image? Well, let's come down to our third diagram here where we have another lens. And what I've done this time is I've taken our aperture stop and I've moved it. I've moved our aperture stop to be at the focal plane of our lens. And so what this means is, is that in this particular case, because I've told you by definition that our chief ray has to travel through the center of that aperture stop, that means that it has to travel through the center of this position here. But since the center of that aperture stop is the focal point of the lens, that means that our chief ray has to be focused all the way to infinity. And what that means is, is that our chief ray is now parallel to the optical axis. So this is a really, really awesome thing. You'll notice here that if we look at this blue line versus this dashed blue line, they're drawn exactly the same. They're just flip-flopped. The difference here is that this is a marginal ray and this is a chief ray. And so this is now our field of view of the lens, right? So we have these different objects at the same height here. And as we move them back and forth, because our angular field of view doesn't change, that means that our objects are going to appear as the same size irrespective of the distance from the lens. Let's head over to the lab and actually take a look at how this works with real telecentric lenses and real fixed focal length lenses. I'll see you over there. All right, so we're over here at the lab and we have a cool setup to illustrate what we were talking about over on the whiteboard. So let's go over what we have set up here to kind of talk about telecentricity in more real terms than just squiggles on a whiteboard. So over here we have a really large telecentric lens and the camera that's on this telecentric lens is an allied vision camera, it has an IMX265 sensor. It's a one over 1.8 inch sensor with a 3.45 micron pixel. Over here we have a six millimeter fixed focal length lens and it's actually the same exact camera from Allied Vision that is being used, so the same sensor, same pixel size. And then we also have a telecentric backlight illuminator that's currently set to off, so no light's coming out of it right now. And what you guys may have noticed as well is that we're looking at model trains here. And there's a specific reason why we chose to use model trains to look at them. And the reason is because train tracks, being very straight, are a great representative for chief rays. And so this train that's right here is actually representative of the chief ray from the telecentric lens. And this train track here is representative of the chief ray coming from the fixed focal length lens. So let's take a look at some of these uh, things in detail and how the different lenses are viewing these trains to again reinforce that idea of what is actually happening with telecentricity. So what we have set up here, like I said, is the two different trains. And this train that's on the left image here is representative of that chief ray for the telecentric lens. And so one thing that you'll notice right away is that you can tell when the train's moving, right? But you can't tell which direction that train is going. It just kind of wobbles back and forth a little bit. And the reason for that, again, is because that train track is exactly on that chief ray of the telecentric lens. And so as the train is moving back and forth, we can't actually see which direction it's moving because it's not changing size. Right? If we look at how the six millimeter lens, which is the camera that's on the right here, how that's viewing the same train, so it's the train on the left on that six millimeter shot, we can clearly tell which direction the train's moving. Right? We're seeing the side of that train, it's moving back and forth. Right? On the flip side, this other train track is at the chief ray for the six millimeter lens. And so as it moves away, we can see the magnification change is really, really apparent, right? This train gets really, really small when it backs off, and as it comes closer, it's getting really large really quickly. And so we can get a great idea for where that is from a depth perspective, but we can't have any idea what the size of that train is at any given spot because it's changing. So that positional uncertainty is creating that error. 
Now the other thing that you'll notice here is that there's actually a better way to illuminate this telecentric field. Uh, because right now we're, we're actually seeing that other lens and we can kind of see that reflection. We're seeing some other reflections that are in here as well. So let's take a look at what we can manipulate uh, in order to see a completely different type of field. And what we're going to manipulate here is the light that we're using. So I mentioned earlier on that we have a telecentric backlight that's in this shot. So I'm going to adjust our camera parameters here. And I'm actually going to change it to a different profile. And it's going to look a little bit weird for a second here because I'm going to click on that light. I'm actually going to also increase our F number just to really stretch out that depth of field that we're going to get on this lens. Now I'm going to click on this light. And now we see a completely different looking field, right? Now all we're seeing is a really nice silhouette of the objects that we're looking at. You can see the train that's moving to and uh, cl that's that's moving closer and farther away from that lens is again not really changing size, but it really accentuates that angle and how straight that chief ray is from this lens. And uh, then you're also occasionally seeing the other train pop into that field there, which you're seeing just about there as it comes inside. But you also notice that really nice silhouette. And these types of images are great to have with telecentric lenses because if you're doing a measurement, basically what it allows you to do is it's almost like doing a pixel threshold that you'd normally do with software, but it's, it's doing that optically. And so you're getting a really, really sharp edge from your lens and from your object coming from this light. And so you're going to get a really accurate measurement of what you're trying to do if you're measuring the size of this train. And so if we needed to measure the, the size of this train, for example, the width of it or, or the height or anything like this, we could do that at any position along this track and we, we would read the same number, right? So that's a really, really cool thing with the telecentric. And just to point out again with the, the standard fixed focal length lens, as this train moves away from the lens, it's going to get much, much smaller. And again, we're not seeing the side of it because the, it's oriented along that chief ray. And that's why we're just seeing the front face of the train, just like we are with the telecentric, but the magnification is changing tremendously. And so that's why you want to use telecentric lenses if you can whenever you're doing any sort of measurement and gauging application. A question that comes up uh, somewhat often as well is, well, can I just continue to use longer and longer focal length lenses? And the answer is, of course you can, um, especially if you go to 100 millimeter focal lengths, things like this, you're going to have a very small magnification change as that working distance varies, but it's still not going to be as accurate as a telecentric lens will. And so generally, if we're going for high accuracy measurement, we tend to like to uh, recommend telecentric lenses whenever we can, especially if there's going to be positional uncertainty with your object. So if you have a fixed focal length lens, especially a long fixed focal length lens, you can use those for measurement, right? As long as there's no positional, positional uncertainty with your, with your object relative to your lens. But as that starts to move, or if you want to get as high accuracy as possible, go with the telecentrics. And I actually have Mary over on the uh, Zoom. She's been watching this as I've been talking about it. Let's actually get her perspective on telecentrics from a lens design perspective. Hey, Mary, how's it going? Oh, it's going pretty good, Nick. How about you? Things are going well. Uh, it was, was really fun to do the, the trains and all that set up uh, for, the, for the telecentric. So I'm really excited to get some of your opinion on that. Uh, but I wanted to first, it, it doesn't look like you're in your office today. Nope, I'm actually at our new facility. Uh, we've opened a manufacturing and des advanced design facility uh, also here in Tucson. And if you look out through that uh, one way window over my shoulder, that's actually out on one of the, the uh, assembly area floors. We've got clean room space, cleaning space. It's a really impressive facility. Oh, nice. So I guess uh, there could be people walking by and stuff like that, uh, uh, but we'll just... Uh, it, we'll... If they do, we'll ignore them. Yeah, sounds like a plan for me. All right. Very good. Well, uh, uh, you know, the, the main thing I wanted to talk to you, of course, today is about telecentricity and telecentric lenses, which we just took a look at uh, both on the whiteboard, talking about some of those concepts, and then in the lab as well, looking at some trains. So I, I, I think the first thing that I wanted to ask you kind of uh, as, as, a, as an optical designer is, is what's different about designing telecentric lenses, right? When, when you're given a task to design uh, something that's telecentric versus non-telecentric. What are the things that are going through your mind and what's going to be different in how you're doing that design? 
Um, and you don't want me to say everything, right? Uh, <laughs> which is actually in a lot of ways uh, sort of true, even though if you look at a lot of, especially simpler telecentric systems, mm -hmm. they start with something that fundamentally looks like our double Gauss photographic objective, but it doesn't behave the same way. And the reason being, as you explained very well during your little training session a few minutes ago, that the key with telecentric systems is they're designed to eliminate this parallax or perspective error. Mm -hmm. Okay, So that requires a totally different way of thinking about the design. The other things that are involved is what's really important in a telecentric system are maintaining those the chief ray angles, either in object space or image space or both, and making sure the stop is at the appropriate focus position. You know, either the back focus of the front element, the front group, or the front focus of the back group, depending upon the type of telecentricity. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is as a designer, there are certain things we like to do. And for example, one of our most useful optimization parameters is the stop position. Mm -hmm. But when I'm designing telecentric systems, I've lost that degree of freedom and I have to find other ways to compensate for it. The other important consideration with telecentric lenses is distortion. Um, distortion is a killer when it comes to telecentric lenses because we talk about, and you drew the so don't work, don't pay attention to the arthritic finger, pretend that's straight. Um, you, you talked about the chief ray orientations and the fact that, let, so let's do on an object space telecentric system. So we've got the rays coming in an image space at an angle, but the, no matter where you put the object, they're going, the chief rays nominally will hit that image at the same height so we can get a good measurement of the, um, magnification. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is with distortion, distortion is by definition an error in the position of the chief ray. So if our chief ray isn't at the right location because of distortion in the system, then our magnification will be off. Now, in most real applications, what's going to happen is an image is taken and knowing what the distortion of the system is, which still has to be a fraction of a percent, then you can sort of subtract that out of the image data to actually get the right information. But you really do need to tightly constrain your distortion whenever you're talking about telecentric lenses. And like I said, you've already taken away some of my favorite degrees of freedom and when we also then add in the requirements to constrain distortion, which is generally ignored in terms of a conventional lens system, believe it or not, um, it's not considered a true imaging aberrations. I'm losing more of those degrees of freedom to correct for the distortion, which potentially introduces other aberrations, which cause me other problems in my telecentric system. So th there, are, there are a lot of things to consider but again, making sure we have the chief rays appro appropriately oriented, making sure we have the stop at this proper location uh, and minimize distortion. Um, and then there's that little added complexity that, you know, in your little video where you suddenly showed the, the really bright image around the train when you turned on the illumination. Uh -huh. um, I also need to worry about is the front portion of my optical system going to create any nasty little ghosts, ghost images of that telecentric illumination that will wash out any detail in what I'm trying to measure. Probably wouldn't be a problem when we're looking at something as cool as that train, uh, but if we were trying to make sure the separation between runs on a printed circuit board or the little electronic connections within a integrated circuit chip were correct, that could be a problem.
Interesting. So there, there are many things to worry about. Yeah, yeah. Well, and 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 telecentrics, they look they look so different as well, pr probably because of the way that they're designed. But I mean, the other thing I wanted to to touch on was they they tend to get so big, right? We see telecentric lenses that like the ones that we had in the demo that are so large and they get really really long. Um, what is, what's the reason for the the size of telecentrics and why they grow the way that they grow, both in length and diameter? Okay, so let me tell you a story. Okay, so one of the things I truly enjoy about when I get to go to a trade show where we're exhibiting is I get to go by the booth and see the demonstrations that you and your team have cooked up for us. <laughs> and the first time I saw that train demonstration using the Titan Telecentric, I was blown away. I thought that was perfect. It was a wonderful way to give a side-by-side -side comparison of a conventional lens versus a telecentric and the advantages of the telecentric in terms of get of measurement accuracy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that the perspective errors you see in conventional optics. That was my first thought. Do you want to know what my second thought was? Absolutely. Wouldn't it be fun to design a telecentric system that actually allowed me to measure the size of a real train car? <laughs> I think I can see where this is going. So Remember, what, what I live in Tucson. Yeah. Well, we have the we have the mirror lab here, so I know we spin cast these eight point six meter optics, and I'm sitting there. Well, you know, a train isn't eight meters; it's only about you know what three or four meters. So, going back to why that is relevant to your question, the telecentric system is only capable of imaging objects smaller than it is. So, if you want to measure something that's and I think we, do we use metric or imperial units on those? But for the heck of it, 200 millimeters in size, you have to have an optics that it's, that's at least 200 millimeters in size. Mm -hmm. um, and then we need to make sure we have, again, that stop position in the appropriate location. And then we need to have a separate set of optics on the imaging side to make sure we get the desired magnification and somewhere in the middle, in the vicinity of that stop, is where we're going to put in a hunk of glass that's technically a beam splitter, where if the stop is here and the beam splitter is here, we're going to put our source here at, a, a, at the image location of that pupil so we can send the light back in, goes back, illuminates the object, and some of it goes back to the image plane. So mm -hmm. there's an awful lot going on in that system, but, but the key driver is if you want to measure something that's bigger than two inches, your optics are going to need to be bigger than two inches. Right. Okay. So that makes a lot of sense. So basically it's, it's, it, is it because the chief rays are parallel to the optical axis and if your object is so high, right. Right. And you need to be able to have a, a lens that's basically going to be where your chief ray is. Right. Well, it's actually got to be a little bit bigger because remember, if my object is out here, I'm going to have like a di slightly diverging ray bundle. Uh, so depending right. upon the object distance, those marginal rays. Now, the difference with a telecentric system is when we think about a conventional optics and I've got an object some distance away, light from that object fills my entrance aperture. Mm -hmm. But with a telecentric system, telecentric and object space, this point on the object only covers a very small portion of my uh, input lens and this right. and this and this. And obviously if I have an infinite number of points, they start to overlap, but I do have to worry about that angle. The mar so the marginal rays go through. So it's rough number is related to the chief rays, but depending upon the object distance, it does need to be a little bit bigger. Right, right. And, and I guess also the F number that you design the lens at, right? If you if it's designed for a smaller F number, those lenses probably need to get even larger, probably especially larger. at higher mags, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing we have to worry about is, by definition, your stop is the surface that limits the on-axis ray bundle. So we need to make sure that that lens isn't limiting that ray bundle Otherwise, we might call that our stop, but our system is technically no longer mm. telecentric. Right. If the stop isn't acting like the stop, it's not telecentric. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so so uh, when we were first talking, you talked about object space and image space telecentricity. 
And I didn't really cover that too horribly often. And I think uh, in the, when we mostly refer to a telecentric lens, we're usually talking about object space telecentricity. But where does or doubly or or doubly right? But where does like where does image space telecentricity come in in general, and how can that be advantageous in a system? Uh, and and how can it also be disadvantageous? Maybe. Okay. Well, we'll talk more a bit about it from the advantageous. Um, perspective. Um, this is doesn't affect you at all because you live in New Jersey. I live in Tucson. I have telescopes. Um, most eyepieces are going to be tele telecentric in that way. Um, so there, there are other applications. The key difference is and why we don't necessarily use them for a lot of our applications in terms of machine vision is what an object space telecentric system is is that our aperture stop is going to be at the second focal point of the front group. Okay, so we have the chief ray coming in parallel and the chief rays are going out at an angle in image space. Okay, in this case, our entrance pupil is at infinity, so don't try to define a standard F number. Um, and what this allows us to do is, even though the, the rays are approaching the sensor at an angle, as we move the object, ideally you'd want to move the image, but in a lot of applications you can't. It's a fixed sensor side, sensor location relative to the system. So you're going to maintain that magnification with the um, object-sided uh, telecentric system. With the image-sided telecentric system, your object location is fixed and you might not know where the sensor location is. So that's not necessarily for machine vision useful. Mm -hmm. However, that doesn't say that thinking about image side telecentricity isn't important because most of our sensors are covered with lenslet arrays. And those lenslet, lenslet arrays have a limited acceptance angle. And what that does is it tells us that any type of optical system, even conventional optics, where you need to image onto one of these sensors with these lenslet arrays, you really want to drive towards, in finger quotes, telecentricity. So there are distinct advantages to image side telecentricity, but not necessarily for machine vision applications. Mm -hmm. But really the the holy grail, if you will, is the double, doubly telecentric system or the 4F type system, mm -hmm. which is telecentric in both object space and image space. And the reason that that is what we really want to strive towards is it gives the advantages of both. You can measure things no matter what their object location is, obviously within reasonable limits. However, telecentric systems have a very large depth of field. So you'd be amazed how how far that object can be off the conveyor belt and you can still measure it. Um, but you also have the advantage that because you're telecentric in image space, you're reaching the sensor at a reasonable angle. So you're going to get a more accurate measurement. So there are lots of advantages to the doubly telecentric system. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, Mary, thank you so much for this. I, I do have one uh, one final question. That's kind of a fun question, um, and uh, it, it's okay. really kind of along the lines of you know, I I I am in something like ZMAX, what I like to call a tinkerer, which is to say, I can get in and I can like focus a lens and I can make minor manipulations. In 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 no way am I a am I a designer, right? But uh, one thing that I've noticed is, you know, going through some of our telecentric lenses and, and any lens, really, there's always this box that just says make telecentric. And I've never once in my 10-ish uh, years uh, in, in my professional career, have I ever seen that box checked? What, what does that box do? And if we, don't, if we never use it in our telecentric lenses, why is it even a thing? Um, I use it, but not in designing telecentric lenses. If I'm designing, define, within ZMAX, you can define your system aperture many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, let's say I had something like a s lasers. 
across my aperture and they were defined by an object space and a then i would okay. typically apply something like that okay. it, it all depends on how you're defining the system yeah okay so it's, yeah so, it, so the, it's not the, necessary for for all applications but uh, there okay. there are going to be some some reasons you would use it. It, it if only it were that easy though right to just design a lens and then just say make telecentric <laughs> Don't I wish? But then again, then I wouldn't have a job. Right? I guess that's true, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, Mary, thank you so much for for sitting down and chatting with me. Uh, I'm so glad you got the got the time to uh, to sit and watch the video and and sit down and chat. So it was great to see you. Good to see you. It was a lot of fun. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thanks, Mary. See ya. Bye.